This conference will now be recorded. Oh, yeah. Fantastic. And so we've got about an hour. We're going to go through some of the house rules that we have here at the Chi Shop is um, plate, put your bread at 12 o'clock. Um, these are the plates that we're eating tonight, Rachel, with our pairings. Oh, they're going to be so good. Yeah. And um, put the bread at 12 o'clock. We're going to go around clockwise. And Rachel's going to guide us through the whole experience. So along with uh, her expertise, there's also guidance from some of the some videos from cheese makers um and videos uh from the well you know i don't even know i haven't seen them so yeah, you haven't. i kept it a secret this is going to be amazing for me uh, so you'll see my reactions too um but stay with us we're going to go through um uh, all five cheeses talk about the producers the source things like that and then we'll taste them based off of rachel's recommendation um and then we've got some pairings on the plate feel free to eat the bread now uh, the olives, uh, th this is a fresh baguette uh, from Easy Tiger. Some of you may have gotten mini toasts. Um, some, uh, we just mix it up sometimes. There's also Castelvetrano olives, the bright green olives. If you don't like olives, these are amazing. These are very fruity. They're more like a fruit than an olive, like the brine. It doesn't taste like the brine. And then we have Spanish cuicos, which are little corn nuts, which are outstanding. And typically, in normal classes, I take you through a tasting experience. But um, tonight, uh, I want to just kind of jump in and give Jewel the floor. Ah, oh, Jessica had said, so we had a comment. I don't know if everybody can see the chat window. I think I might be the only one. So through the course of the night, I'll feed you, Jewel, Rachel. Um, you'll hear me go in and out of calling her Rachel and Jewel. She is a rock star in the cheese industry. Um, she, yes, so she is one of the nicest people you'll meet. Um, and she's going to talk about Essex, but uh, our team uh, absolutely adores Rachel. I'll use your first name for most of the night. Um, uh, okay. You, Jewel, we're friends. You can call me Jewel. You can call you Jewel. Yes. Okay. And it looks like everybody can see the chat window. Thank you, Joseph. Um, usually we do like a guided tasting uh, and sensory analysis. Tonight there's video, so much video content. And we'll have a lot of questions that I kind of want to just um, jump in. Sally and Neil, great question. Uh, the cheese, uh, what we want at 12 o'clock is the bread tonight. So that's going to be at your 12 o'clock. Um, and so, well, Jewel, you want to jump in and introduce yourself? Um, yeah. I am just thrilled to have you. This is great. Uh, we at Antonelli's Cheese Shop love Essex cheese. And I love Antonelli's. I was just there, like literally exactly a month ago. Um, you guys were my last trip which is why I think this is so special because we all have this fantastic time together. No surprise, we always do. Your team's so great, you have such great synergy. Um, and so then, yeah, when all of a sudden it was like, oh, I'm stuck, you were the very first people I called. <laughs> so it's, I'm really excited about tonight. Um, so a little background, many of you may be familiar with our cheeses because Antonelli's, as they've been in business for 10 years, have sold our cheeses since day one, um, particularly the Comte Day, which is included tonight. And so then um, what was really special is the relationships, like uh, John says, that we have with obviously John and Kendall, but their buyers um, and Alex, who does the wholesale and Andy, who does the buying and their mongers and the shops and Nicholas and all these great things. And so um, Alex actually was able to visit um, the producers. Every producer were on the table tonight. He went with me last year to the farms. So my job with Essex, we're small company importers, and my job is education, it's literally all I want to do and all I do <laughs> um, in the best way. And so my job really is to learn as much as possible about the farms that we work with, um, the history behind these kinds of cheeses, they're classic cheeses. So just a brush up of what we're going to go through tonight. We're visiting four different countries, um, both visually and through our mouth, our taste buds. Um, so we're going to visit Parmigiano Reggiano and Modena, Italy. We're going to go to uh, Sierra La Solana, which is in Castilla de la Mancha, Spain. We're going to go to the south of Holland uh, for Ville de Vida. We're going to go to the north of Holland, where really big goudas come from. And then we're going to end in, um, or actually before then, though, we're also going to go to France, in the Jura, right on the Swiss border. And so these are cheeses you've probably heard of before, at least in style. Gouda, Comte, at least in Alpine style, mountain, Gruyere cheeses you've heard of. Parmigiano Reggiano, of course, you have. It's a king of cheese. Manchego is super popular. 
Um, but our job is to identify the best in class versions of these cheeses and build really, really strong relationships with our producers, um, which is why this is so special for me. I, I tend to be able to do this in person. So like Alex is able to come, we've connected John and Kendall when they went on vacation to Spain with our producers. They've been to the fort before in France. Um, but I rarely get to actually share this much behind the scenes with just cheese customers. Um, so I'm really excited because this is basically everything I ever want to do is connect people with the people I love over in Europe. So this is great. I'm really excited for tonight. Thank you. All right. So, so yeah, so through the course of this experience, um, Rachel's going to dive into video content and uh, she'll be sharing her screen. So again, you might want to, at the top of your screen, if you hadn't heard it yet, there's a, an option to change the way you view um, what you're looking at. If you go to the top and choose view active cameras um, in as an option, when Jewel does go to present, I'll turn off my camera if I figure out how to, and then we'll be able to see more in full screen her experience. So, um, and again, if you have any questions, feel free to type them into the chat. And uh, do you want to dive us in with the? Uh, yeah, let's start with Italy. Italy. Um, so we're gonna start with Italy tonight. The, oh, the reason, oh, sorry. We have, we have Essex came in first on the plate. Oh, actually Conte, okay, cool. No, no worries. I, um, I call it Essex, 1605. Oh, Manchego, okay, yeah. Manchego. That's what we were debating, which one, you're right. Yeah. Um, so we're gonna go to Spain first. Um, and so to kind of give you an idea of what we're going to do tonight, like uh, John said, this was two weeks ago, we had this idea. And so I've been scrambling for the last 10 days to get our farmers to, who are on small locations, they don't have marketing teams, um, to pull together all this special content for you tonight. So I'm really, really happy about it too, because they've worked really hard. They were so eager to share this with you. So in particular, um, each video that we have is basically going to share with you behind the scenes of the producers. Um, some of it will have dialogue. Spain does not have any dialogue because our cheesemaker, Maria Jose is very nervous about her English and didn't want to. Um, she was too humble. So it's beautiful though and incredibly peaceful and I think kind of the perfect way to set us and transport us away to somewhere really beautiful. Um, so for those, before I get into the video, for those who haven't had Manchego before, it's a Spanish sheep's milk cheese. This one is raw milk because it's made in the very traditional way. The rind is edible. So if you want to eat that, I strongly encourage it. It's very mild and very, almost like popcorn-y in flavor. Really, really delicious and adds a great dimension to the cheese. Um, and it's 100% sheep's milk and uh, we do a lot of selection with the flavors, but I'm gonna now just dive in and let you see this beautiful place. It is Farmstead. So they have all their own feed. They grow for the animals. So we'll start, that's what you'll see first. Um, then you'll see the animals, they own their own sheep. They use that milk to make their cheese. You'll see part of the cheese production process and then they age the cheese themselves and take care of it all by hand um, with a really small team of like five people. So this is really exciting to be able to yeah, see. Yeah, and as a little caveat, y'all, these folks went out and they filmed most of this video content in the last, I don't know, five days. And so if it's a little choppy or if it, if you don't hear something quite right, um, definitely uh, we'll, at, at the end, once the video is over, if you type in the chat, we can make some adjustments for you. We can provide some feedback, answer some questions. Is what I was trying to say. All right, you got it, Jewel. Great. All right, try to share screen. Oops, sorry. We did this test run, and it's still always a little, always a little interesting. First one, and then we'll get it all after that. There we go. There we go. And I threw you off. So the cheese that we'll be tasting is the big triangle. Um, the, the, uh, some customers, the cheese got jostled in the car. Um, so this, it has this, uh, if you can see this sort of tire track looking pattern on the rind. So that's what we'll be tasting. All right, are we good? Yes. Can you see my screen? Sure can. Great. I will hit play. Okay. 
So this is, I'm gonna just talk a little bit just where we're at. So we're two hours southeast of Madrid in La Mancha, which is where Manchego legally has to be made. This farm in particular is really special. They have all their own land to graze and also grow the food for their animals. So this is also almond trees, um, which right now would actually be about to bloom um, in the next couple of weeks. Um, and they actually, the almonds that fall to the ground, the sheep graze in addition to fresh dry grasses and herbs. So they have about 1,200 of their own sheep. Um, they do a great deal of work of taking care of the animals so they're in optimal health, which is why they don't want to grow and have any old sheep. This is as much as their four shepherds can handle. Rachel, is this going into a, um, is this just the cheese make room or was that just yes, in a holding all tank? The same building. Uh, so the dairy was literally two doors away from where they're at right now, which is the All in the same building. So they practice captive farming. They want things to travel the least amount of distance as possible, both from an environmental footprint standpoint, um, but also for the work and the quality of milk as well. Uh, less time it has to travel, the safer it is, and also the better quality flavors. You can see here the cheese has been made, the curd has been cut, and now this is what we call cooking. So you're cooking up the curds, they do it by hand. Um, larger manchego producers do this all by machine, so it's much faster. However, you trap a lot of fluid in the cheese when you do it in machines, and that's why you get plastic cheese. Um, by doing it by hand this way, they're able to get out as much bacon as possible and get a finer cake. So now this is going to come across to create the form. As you see, it's a natural room with the classic Esparto design. will travel on that belt to go into the brine. So they brine for 18 hours. So brine is a salt water solution in order to add flavor and it also helps to add bacteria. And here are the caves, which are just a couple of um just literally 20 feet away from the cheese maker. So like I said again they practice that passive talk um agriculture where things are traveling the least amount of distance as possible. So Rachel, do you want to pause for a second? Yeah. All right. All right. So we had a couple a couple guests have some trouble okay. hearing during the cheese make process. Oh sure. And, and uh, the the 
uh, the video just had some noise in it. But um, what you, what you all just saw was the process um, that the cheese will f flow from the milk through to the aging. And so we saw the uh, the curd being added into the those plastic molds, and those molds have um, that that pattern that I showed you on the rind of this cheese, that sort of tire track looking pattern, that's all imprinted on the inside of those molds. And that's where there'll be some pressure applied to that mold um, so that it pushes the whey out. And, and this was what um, Jewel was uh, explaining during that part of the process. And then what would happen, they'd be, they'd be turned slightly pressed some more, and then they'd go into a brine solution. Um, and then they would ride through on the, those conveyor belts. And so again, if you have any other questions, we can always pop back. Um, but this is sort of the live action process all the way now. You're looking into the maturation room. Um, and what we'll do is that every like 20 seconds or so, we'll pause so you can see uh, if, if there's a question. You, are, you can start up again, Rachel. Great. Rachel, why is it called 1605? Yeah, so it's called 1605 because that's the first year that Don Quixote de la Mancha, the book, was published, um, which is the first written record of Manchego in history. And so for them, this creamery, um, the farm itself has been around since 1878. And through all that time, they were making various kinds of Spanish cheese, including Manchego, but really had gone very industrial because of the dictator Franco. Um, until 2002. And so 2002, they were bought by a new owner who wanted to go back to making traditional Manchego because there was only one left. The rest were all very large factories. So he knew that the first record was in this book and he asked himself the question, what would that cheese have been that Don Quixote uh, gave to his lady lover in order to try to woo her? And so it would have been raw milk because Louis Pasteur was not alive yet in the 1600s. It would have had a natural rind because we weren't coating anything until we started doing trade in the 1800s on chips and needed to make sure to protect cheese. Uh, you would have had your own feed because you have farms and things um, and you're already growing oats and barley. So you would just feed that to your animals. Uh, you'd have your own animals, so that's a given. And you also would use your own rennet from your lambs. And so for them, that was important because none of those things are written in the rules for the Manchego cheese, the Manchego PDO, protected designation of origin. So that's why they use the name 1605 on their brand to give homage to where they found their recipe. Awesome, thank you. You want, is it, you want to finish the video up? So this is how they're traditionally aged in their storage room. These are plastic containers. This is considered modern technology um, from a food safety standpoint. And you can see how many batches upon batches are within this facility. And that, that greenish co coating is a mold. It's wonderful. Awesome. So I'm just going to pause here real fast because what she's been doing is showing you the batches. So the first cheeses we saw were made in October. So it's cheeses we would be buying about. Um, you're about five months old. We buy at five months. And these, as John just noticed, they had that pretty blue gray mold on them and it's nice and fuzzy um, and well controlled. But now you all of a sudden went to May 2019. So we're at 10 months old. And as you may be able to see, the molds have started to fall off actually on their own. And that's because they've started to die off. Um, so this would be the oldest they would age their cheese because if you just keep it in there any longer, there's no more activity happening. But I thought that was interesting that she wanted to show us that. I would not have noticed that if okay. you hadn't pointed it out, that's cool.
So just to give you an idea of what they're doing here, every day for the first two months, they rub the wheels gently to control the molds. So you want good mold on cheese, you don't want bad molds. And if you don't ever touch the cheese, if you don't ever turn it, you'll see them flip it. Um, bad molds can develop and can cause problems. And so by doing this work that's very hands-on, um, you can control the good molds and that's why they do it. Nice, that looks awesome. So if you want to turn your camera back on, Rachel, and I'll do mine. So now we can eat the cheese. If you haven't already eaten it, Rachel, you want to walk them through? I've already been nibbling. I broke my own rule. Sure, bad student. It's okay. Yeah. Um, it's dinner time. So yeah, so the cheese, as I said, it's raw milk, it's natural rinded. What we're going for in the flavor profile, so this is the part where our job steps in as, an, as a selector. Um, we buy it at around six months, um, or it lands in the United States at around six months, I should say, because there's five weeks of transport. And so what we're trying to get is flavors that are showing the natural food they give to their animals. So we don't want it to be really piquant. Uh, we don't want it to be very aggressive. There's a lot of manchegos out there that are that way. And instead, what we want is to show the wonderful work that you saw the shepherds doing. They make sure to graze them and give them a balanced diet. The amount of hands-on work these cheesemakers are doing, nothing's automated. We want to highlight that work as opposed to going for the strongest flavor possible. So what we tend to find, particularly for Antonelli's cheese, so we do a secondary triage just for Antonelli's, is we're looking for flavors that do stand out, um, not too subtle. Um, but we look for great savory kind of lamb flavors without being what we use the word billic. Billic being like bile, um, which can happen in sh raw sheep's milk if you don't control it. So what we're going for is great, like think like, I think lamb stew. Think great balanced, savory, sweet, meaty notes with nice hints of aromatic spice. So like cardamom, any uh, an anise seed, things that you would put into a brown sauce. It's tasting really good right now. Good. That's a, good, a really good piece of cheese. Um, and you can eat the rind if you want. You can try the rind. It has uh, some of that uh, mold still in there. So you'll get some of that uh, intensity on the palate, but it is delicious overall. And tonight we paired it with um, a quince paste, a cutting preserve from um, Girl Meets Dirt in Washington. It's uh, just, a young lady that left the professional world to live and get her hands dirty, uh, get her hands in the dirt. And uh, so she sources all local to Washington state um, organic fruit to make these. And it just, Membrio and Manchego grew up together. Um, they are a popular combination. And so this is a little Washington state flavor profile for you. So awesome. Yeah, so I saw some stuff about age on here in the chat. Um, so like I said, ours is six, and in the cave you did see up to a year, but like I mentioned, that the molds actually start dying. They have a life cycle like any bacteria does, and so um, they don't really push their cheeses to be old um, because that can die even younger than 10 months. So we always consistently get six months, but we do selection on flavor as opposed to age because within even two weeks of production, the flavor could be all over the place. Um, so yeah, but what you have tonight is around six months and the yeah. oldest they ever sell is about 14. That's very, very rare and only in Spain. And I personally don't really care for it actually. It's, well, I care for this piece of cheese. This was, this tasted this, amazing. Yeah, this is incredible. And that's why I'm like, we're good. It's amazing. All 98 of us are very happy right now. I, um, awesome. You want to, uh, want to dive into Giorgio? Let's go to Italy, yeah. which our man in Italy, our man in Italy. He is um, so just a little background on him. We've worked with Giorgio Cravero since 2008. Uh, his family, though, you'll learn about they've been in the business for a long time. 
Um, and what's very fortunate about the situation right now is that he actually lives next door to his caves. So filming this was very simple <laughs> for him. He just had to walk 10 feet. So he was very grateful to be able to do this for you all, which is great. And those of you that have been on um, some of the cheese tastings previously, I, I always mention I got to go to Bra, Italy for the largest uh, cheese festival in the world, uh, a slow food cheese. And the, his aging facility is in that town, it's walk, walking distance from that festival. It's pretty amazing. All right, so as Rachel, you get a setup. If you'll turn off your camera again this time, it gets allows us to see full screen, which is great. So microphone on and I'm ready to share screen. Yeah, we can hear you. Great. And you can see the screen? Oh, there he is, yep. Great, here we go. And this should hopefully be less noisy. So he's just a cave, he's not a producer. So there shouldn't be um, mechanical sounds in the background. Hello there. It's lunchtime and we are in Pra, in Piemonte, in the northwest of Italy. My name is Giorgio Cravero and uh, I'm leading you to a virtual tour of our caves where we mature the so-called king of cheese, the Parmigiano Reggiano. and welcome the Cavero Caves. My family is involved in the uh, selection and in the maturation of the Parmigiano Reggiano cheeses since 1855. The fact that we are involved in the selection and in the maturation of the cheeses explains something uh, crucial, it's preliminary uh, things to know, that we don't make the cheese, we don't produce the cheese. The Parmigiano Reggiano cheeses uh, are uh, produced uh, in a, a region of a uh, uh, northern Italy called Emilia Romagna, uh, specific, specifically in five provinces, which are the provinces of Parma, Reggio Emilia, Mantova, Modena, and Bologna. Uh, it's uh, definitely the most important and probably most famous product of the uh, Italian agriculture. And uh, the yearly production is uh, absolutely uh, huge. We are talking about 3.7 million cheeses a year. Uh, my job uh, includes two different professions. Uh, I love to describe myself either a selector or a maturer, maturer and affiners are the uh, same word. The selection of the cheeses happens at the age of 12 months uh, for the Caravero business in two different farms. Uh, one is located in uh, uh, the Modena mountainside, Modena province mountainside, and the other one is located in the Reggio Emilia hills. We select our cheeses at the age of uh, 12 months, mainly, but uh, a concept uh, that for our uh, business is crucial. We select our cheese by terroir. So we identify 
two different places around the production area where the uh, uh, the soil uh, the grass the specific flora of these two different areas the absence of pollution uh, the uh, small dimension and artisanal uh, dimension of the dairies the cheesemaker skill uh, let us um, uh, choose in our cheeses in uh, these two places that we consider the best. The selection happened at the, end, the age of 12 months. Uh, that means that uh, for the first year of their life, the cheeses spend their uh, their life uh, uh, at the uh, dairy's facility. When the cheeses are 12 months old, we move them from the dairy's facilities to ours, where we are right now in Prague. Uh, in this case, we have rooms for 5,000 wheels. It's a really a small place, but uh, everything is a um, uh, checked uh, and uh, uh, regularly. I'm talking about uh, the second part of my business being a nothinger. We need to check uh, the humidity, the temperature, uh, the cleanness, of course, of the case, depending on season and time of the year, outside temperature, inside humidity, and so on. Every two weeks, uh, we need to turn uh, uh, each cheese to ensure an even maturation of the texture. Every single step during the uh, time of our uh, uh, affinage in these rooms is every single step is. Uh, uh, organize to reach the final goal, which is uh, when the cheese are 24 uh, months, we need to have uh, a uh, guarantee that we and uh, moreover, uh, sweetness, a fruitiness of the taste which are our goals and our obsession, I love to say. Uh, something else I would like to show you uh, that it's truly important. Uh, it's uh, somewhere else, so we need to move to a different part of, the, of, of our facility. Please come with me. And if you can't picture what a room like that smells like, it's heavenly, y'all. Yeah, the best description I have for what it smells like is just perfectly cooked butter um, on a grilled cheese sandwich. So when you have that toasted butter smell, that's what this cave always smells like year round, no matter what, which like John said is, is heaven because who doesn't want cheese toasties smell all the time. Yum. I also love it's his 18 year old son doing the filming because he's trying to go to film school, actually. Uh, so we pulled him in to practice for this project. I forgot to tell you something interesting. Why are you wearing this coat? because uh, it's quite cold right now. Uh, we have around 10 degrees Celsius and 70% uh, uh, of humidity. None. Yeah, as a note, so this time of year, that temperature and humidity is natural, like he said. That's because from the months of November to April, they actually turn off all automated temperature control. 
And they do that so the cheeses don't over sweat because it's really cold outside. And if the caves stay really warm, um, the cheeses would sweat and they get too dry. This was founded by my great-great-grandfather on 1855, here in Prague, by this man, John my great-great-grandfather, 1855. Then Giorgio uh, uh, left the company to Giacomo, my great grandfather, to Giorgio, my grandfather, to Giacomo, my dad, to me, I'm the fifth generation uh, of Parmigiano Giano selector and mature. To be honest, 500 years ago, more than 100 years ago, uh, my ancestor used to be trader of uh, other cheeses like uh, uh, the classic Italian Taleggio and Gorgonzola. Then my grandfather Giorgio, uh, around uh, 1920, focused everything just on Parmigiano Reggiano. There's something interesting I want to show you. On 1886, my family sold some cheeses to Mr. Dutto Pietro on the uh, 211 West 27th Street in New York. So we have quite an experience to ship some cheeses to, to the United States. So guys, uh, uh, thanks very much for watching. And uh, I look forward to seeing you all in uh, the United States soon. Uh, best wishes. Ciao, ciao. Awesome. That's super cool. I've never seen that stuff before. So those of you that have gotten to eat this, um, there is something awesome if you if you dunk it in this uh, balsamic vinegar. This is aged up up to 18 years in the traditional Modena methodology. Um, clap on, clap off, Rachel. Um, uh, it's wonderful. This is a great party trick. The mouthfeel on this cheese is unbelievably splendid. I consider this um, this isn't what I would consider a grating cheese. You can grate it and elevate your meal, but you can also just eat it like this. This cheese is outstanding. Yeah, so to the point of what Giorgio's family has always been trying as we eat this cheese. So as you noticed, it's been 160 plus years of working with Parmigiano Reggiano specifically. They used to do some other cheeses. And the point of what they were doing was that where they were located isn't in the area of production, but they're located in a really key market trade area of Bra, which is in between Modena, Torino, and Milan. So they were a great location for producers to get their cheeses to them and then help them get to market because when you have these small farms, doing that on their own is very difficult. Um, so Giorgio's family has always had very close relationships with the producers and trying to get them to the best customers possible um, based on their quality. And so now they used to work with more producers, more and more producers are going out of business or being bought by very large corporations. So he only works with two right now. Um, the one you're having right now is called San Pietro, and that's made in Modena that we spoke about. Um, and what he's looking for with Modena, it's the it's high hills. It's the Apennine Mountains, actually, so around 2,100 feet in elevation. Uh, so low mountains, but really diverse grasses. So if you think about, you hear about summer milk ever, or you go into Antonelli's by Alpage Gruyere ever, um, that is because that's when the cows were eating summer high mountain grasses and that has other flavors that are fruitier, sweeter, more um, uh, complex. And so this Parmigiano Reggiano though is always made um, in the mountains all the time. So that's not a seasonal thing. And so you get more floral, nutty, I get beautiful Meyer lemon citrus 
um, really nice notes, and it's very consistent. So year round, you have this beautiful flavor, and it's always 24 months, which also lends to the consistency also, um, because age makes a huge difference when it comes to texture and flavor. So we only ever buy this one farm, one age profile, and um, stick to the consistency of a table cheese, something that, again, kind of like with the Manchego, we're trying to do good by the work they're all doing. So yes, of course, it's fantastic to cook with, don't get me wrong. Um, the rinds also are perfect for cooking, freeze those and keep them on hand um, for anything and everything. But the real purpose of what Giorgio is trying to do with this cheese is to make sure people enjoy it and just eat it and serve with the balsamic de I mean, balsamico de Modena is perfect. It's literally 20 minutes from the farm. So it, oh, it's so good. And yeah, maybe one day we can all travel to Bra together. Wouldn't that be nice? So great. Be wonderful. So, so awesome. All right. Next on our plate, we have Ville Divide. Um, and uh, this one, Julie, you mentioned the other day, you got a one of a kind video and um, I can't wait to see it. I've been, I've been thinking about it all week. I got more than I, I literally got more than I asked and I didn't know I could have ever asked for this. And I'm known for asking for the moon. So I didn't even know I could ask for this. Um, so something really special you're going to see. Bill Divide is a really small farm in the South of Holland and actually the province called South Holland. Um, it's a Borenkas cheese, so a Gouda, but there's more of that phrase in Holland for Borenkas because Boren means farm, kas cheese, farmhouse cheese. And so every farm historically in the Netherlands would have their own recipe. Um, Gouda, Borenkas cheeses date back to the 1300s. And so everyone would have their own breed of cow. The terroir in Holland is all over the place in variety, even though it's a very small country. And that's because it's reclaimed land. You, if anyone's ever been to the Netherlands in this group, um, it's all polders and windmills and dikes trying to get water out of the land so that they don't sink. Um, but that makes for very diverse soil. And so that means the food, the grasses, the flowers, everything that grows in those areas is different literally by 20 kilometers. So it makes a really big difference. Every farm would have a very different product. Um, so this cheese really represents that. that Farmhouse Burenkas cheese is very much dying in the Netherlands just because it's expensive work and many children don't want to carry on the legacy of their parents. Um, which is why this is really exciting to share Ville Divida because one, it's just not common to get these kinds of cheeses. But two, up until two years ago, their son did not want to be a part of the business. Um, and now you're actually going to see him. He did all of this for us this last week um, because he's really passionate about it now and has. A change of heart so i'm very excited to share this with you okay can you see my screen Yes, we can. Great. Here we go. Hi there. I'm Norval Skoon. I'm the fifth generation of my family farming on this place, an island in the Netherlands between Amsterdam and The Hague. We are making cheese here for generations without uh, pasteurizing. We use the raw milk straight from the cow and we use this for making the cheese. My family has been doing this for all the generations. When my father came here in 1960, when he started here, he stopped with making cheese twice a day, he started making cheese once a day. And also we changed things, we started with organic farming in 2000, and since then we are making a, a good business of it. And now we are waiting for our son, he's going on with it, and he will change some things. But I'm very happy that uh, our family farm can move on. So I wanted just to pause because so they live on an island. Their family owns two islands. Um, but literally to get the cows to move between islands, they have to use his own little ferry, which I just love. Um, but what he's doing right now is actually going to meet the milk truck because he has to deliver milk using like milk cans, big milk cans. Um, but the 
their dairy truck cannot get to his island, so he has to use the boat every time, which I love. <laughs> My name is Joost. I'm a sixth generation farmer on this island. Uh, although in my youth I was not really planning to take over the family farm, uh, I got to the, uh, to the insight that farming is really the best uh, way to spend your time. So uh, now I'm fully focused on it, uh, learning a lot uh, from my father and my mother uh, about the cows, about the land, about the cheese making and about business and um, yeah I'm really, into, really into this uh, adventure now and uh, a lot of stuff is already uh, coming onto my path and uh, it's a big adventure to, uh, to tackle all the challenges. Hi everyone, I'm now going to tell you something about the most important inhabitants, inhabitants of our farm, of our island and of course we're talking here about the cows. There they are, 50 ladies. And uh, about 20 years ago, my parents were traveling in France, in the Jura, and they came across these cows. And my mother said, Oh, Jan, these are very beautiful cows. What, what, what type of breed is it? And my father said, Yeah, these are the famous Montbéliard cows. It's a very strong and robust uh, uh, breed. Uh, and they provide very good milk. Even when they get uh, a little bit less nutritious food, uh, they give a little bit less milk, so the cow stays healthy and, uh, and provides good quality milk. So these two points, so making my mother very happy and also uh, having a very healthy uh, type of cow in our fields, made my father decide, okay, we're going to go for, for the Montbéliard cows. Well, today is a very exciting day because the cows are uh, going into the meadows again. They've been in the stable for uh, since uh, November. Um, so probably they will be excited and we're going to uh, be able to see some, uh, some cow dancing. So I'm going to bring you uh, with me to the field and we're going to experience some cow dancing.
So just to give you an idea of the space, when we started this video, they were outside the front of their house, but inside their house is where they're at. So if you walk to the through the door, you turn right, you're in the room right here. If you walk to the left, so if you're looking at this camera and you see the tiled floor in the background, their kitchen is to the left um, and the cheese caves are to the right and their bedrooms are upstairs and the cows are just 30 feet away outside. So truly a farmhouse made cheese. I'm still speechless from watching the cow stance. I've never seen the never seen that. It's amazing. awesome. Maybe we can just have the cows playing in the background all the rest of the year. All the time, right? Yeah, it's so amazing. That's what I said earlier that I did not ask for because I didn't put, I just wanted this project done when I spoke to John two weeks ago. It was like, okay, film some things, get your kids involved, let's try to do something. And I didn't think that this is the time of year that the cows are going out. And so, and then the, the, the timing that it was this week, they already planned it. They didn't do it early for us. Like, so it's so just. It's and in case you missed it, they've been in the barn since November. They have been not been allowed out of the barn. So it's very much um, like uh, somebody commented very much like how we're going to feel a few months from now when we finally get to. Yes. So Please. these cows have been sheltered in place and safe. It's good for them, you know, they've been happy, but they're really, really happy. So um, what's special about also the land, so I said it's their own polders, which is the Dutch word for reclaimed land or island, um, but it's organic. So the grasses that grow there are very specific to this, this region, but also because he's allowed to be organic, it's a really highly nutritious feed. And so what his son Joost was saying, about this robust cow. Um, so this cow typically is actually from the French mountains. So it seems bizarre to bring it to below sea level and expect it somehow to like to, to give still very high quality milk. Um, but that was the appeal of the Montbelliard cow was that they can actually give incredibly nutritious, incredibly flavorful milk. And so with, I hope you've dug into this cheese. I can't help it. I've been eating it throughout the whole video. Um, it's aged around 15 months, so if anyone's wondering that, and that's specific to us. So Jan said that when he was in the caves, um, it stays in his caves uh, for about three months, and we've been working with him since 2008, and up until 2008, he's been making cheese here, his whole family, for five generations. This recipe, organic, with Montbelliards, since around 1998, 
So he had been making cheese for 10 years and only aging it to six months at the most because you saw the size of his cave. It's tiny. Um, so he just sells it in local markets and he was happy with that. And he would sell to Betty, who you're going to meet in another video. And, um, but our owner Daphne visited. And when you see this farm, that final picture, it's beyond idyllic. Um, and also the cheese is incredibly gorgeous in quality. The, everything about it is amazing, but Daphne and Betty believed, what if we could take this cheese to 15 months? Um, six months is great, but it's more of like a sandwich cheese. It's, it's nice and sliceable. It's wonderful with butter and toast and uh, country hams, but it doesn't have the crystalline structure and the flavor bomb isn't quite there. Um, and so they, we at Essex, we take on the financial responsibility at three months so that he doesn't have to age it. And he also doesn't have to worry about sitting on that money because otherwise normally he would not get paid until he sold it to us at 15 months. So. Um, this has been an exclusive project with us for the last 12 years now. Um, and the flavors are incredible. Like it's unlike mm -hmm. any. The cheese is perfect, perfect today. It's, yeah. and, and we paired it with a Turkish apricot. Um, yes. Oh, good. Okay, you... well, because my favorite, I'm doing Turkish apricots too. Oh, nice. It's my all time favorite pairing. And I don't like apricots. Hmm. But with this Vildivida, especially if you can throw in a raw unsalted almond, put them all together, it's literally like a pina colada. Like there's this bizarre pineapple coconutty thing that happens. It's super boozy because of the raw milk. Like you've got this raw intensity of flavor. It's just magical. Who knew? So good. So good. Miss uh, Deborah Dickerson, one of my cheese Hi, heroes. Deborah. One of uh, currently uh, helps op run and operate Cowgirl Creamery um, in uh California, if you haven't had Mount Tam or Red Hawk or anyway, Deborah is a mentor of mine um, and a mentor of almost everybody else in the cheese industry. Mother um, of cheese. She asked when the if when these wheels get waxed. Do you happen to know what, what yeah. like time in their lifespan? Yeah, so they're brined first for around three days, um, dried out for 24 hours after that, and then they start the coating process. Um, and at that point, they start coating every day to build it up. Um, and then they start weaning back on it. It's about like a, I want to say like a three week process, first week every day. And then it starts going every other day or so. And his wife is the one who does the coating. And That's it's awesome. a natural, it's a natural, so you can't eat it, but it's um, a food safe, natural coating. Many Goudas in Holland use what's a paraffin. So like if anyone's gotten their pedicures and you get a paraffin wax pedicure, um, that's actually what's used on a lot of Goudas because it holds in moisture. Great. Um, but they choose something that's more natural because it allows some moisture to actually escape and you don't get off flavors then. It's also organic approved then. Awesome. Thank you. And thanks to everybody who have Cowgirl Creamery in their fridge right now. That's awesome. I know. So, cool. so now we have Comte, Marcel Petit. I know it's already seven o'clock y'all, but, uh, when the cheesemakers speak, we let them speak. So, um, hopefully you'll be able to stick with us a little bit longer. If you do have to get off, uh, you have an important meeting at 7.05. Um, this, we're going to record the rest of this experience. So if you do need to get off, just email me at uh, john at antonellischeese.com. And then I can send you the link um, of, to the video sometime in the next 48 hours. Um, all right, Jewel, the floor is yours again for Comte Marcel Petit. Right. you can see my screen yes and as uh, yes we can great um, so I'm gonna hit play but just to give you a preface on how this video is going to work uh, so Comte is a cow's milk cheese um, from France on the Swiss border but a, um, we're not visiting a producer we're visiting the caves where it's aged because that's where our work steps in and it's a truly special experience of what you're going to see in fact um, the selection process, it's all in French. I did add subtitles. I apologize if they're not super clear to see. So I am going to actively pause this one much more to translate kind of what's happening in each stage. Um, but to give you an idea of what we do, um, the cheese is brought to these caves when they're three weeks old. 
we buy anywhere from 12 months to 18 months and we go every six weeks to do what you're about to see. Um, and it's never been recorded. I recorded this when I was there in October doing our selection for the holidays. Um, they're usually pretty stingy about recording, but I built a very strong relationship with them and promised to not post it. <laughs> so, um, yeah, that's what you're going to see. So just give, kind of give you an idea of what you're about to witness. So we're driving up the mountain to get to this fort. This fort is built into the side of the mountain. It was used during the Napoleonic War um, as boot camp. Um, but then when World War II happened and technology changed, the boot camp was no longer needed and was abandoned um, until the 60s. And then it started to be used for cheese. So the region is called Jura. It comes from the Roman word for forest, and as you can tell, it's incredibly deciparous in all the trees. So you know. We are eating the little, the little cubes, uh, the little sort of uh, rectangle bites. This is the Comte by Marcel Petit. Um, and we're pairing that with an apple and onion jam from American Spoon in Michigan. It is, I, I just have to say to preface this experience that this is the one of the two cheeses that made me fall in love with cheese for the first time. Not just any Comte, but Marcel Petit Comte. Um, this changed my life, so hopefully it changes yours today. Okay. I have I have not gotten to go to the Marcel Petit uh, location yet, sadly. That'll be on my future. Yeah, we're we're gonna fix that. Hell yeah. Um, And this, this piece of cheese, Jewel, is extra brothy right now. Oh, fantastic. So, yeah, well, um, as you see, what he's talking about, extra brothy, um, you're, so what you're going to see, Marcel Petit Comte ages in these caves. So that door is the door underneath to go underground. Um, and that's the entire structure that you see from the outside. And they age over 100,000 wheels of cheese. They're 80-pound wheels, so they're massive. In this fort, you're going to meet Jose, who's the gentleman we work with directly. Um, but there's only six to seven men who take care of all those cheeses by tasting them and match. I call them matchmakers. So basically, what we do every six weeks for the last, I can do math, 14 years, um, is go and they help us find our Essex cheese. So um, we'll talk more about the flavor profile later, but you're going to see why it matters what we do, that we don't just let them do it all for us. So like I said, we always go from, we started a year old, I was here in October, but anywhere up to 18 months. So on this particular trip, we immediately went to Cheeses Made in August 2018 um, and visited a specific fruitier or cheesemaker named 815. So what he's doing there, he's listening for cracks in the cheese by banging on the side of a cheese like that. They do that in Parma, Parmigiano Reggiano as well. They can hear cracks or air holes, which is pretty amazing. Yeah, and the reason why they want to do that is because if you don't catch the cracks, um, if you don't pay attention to that, what happens is that fissure in the cheese then pulls moisture into that area. Um, and you can cause off texture. So imagine a cheese that now has like a wet spot inside and it starts to break down the cheese, you get weird flavors, weird textures. And that's okay if you're only gonna sell it, you know, a hundred miles away and it's gonna get there very quickly. 
we're trying to get cheeses from this part of the world on a very long journey, probably eight weeks before it gets to Texas. So if we were to ignore these cracks, we could have some very um, bro literally broken cheese that would show up in Texas. So that's a lot of the process is making sure we don't have cracks. C'est le mai ou juin? C'est le So to show what he's doing here, they taste, there's 100,000 wheels, six or seven men, they each taste um, every cheese up to four times before it is sold. So the reason why he's trying to make some marks is to send a message to his teammates um, of what has been tasted. And some of these marks are, we have yet, they won't let us know what the code means, but basically sold, selected, or needs more time or, whatever, they have all their things. So he's going to wait to give the final slash or mark until we've given our opinion. He looks so confident. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I'm with our owner, Jason Hines, who does the selection every six weeks. He's saying caramel, caramel, caramel. The team is like, oh yeah, it has basically the notes we're typically looking for. And then I like to throw a wrench in. The salty caramel, sweet. Long flavor. as you might have seen the subtitles, I was explaining that, yes, it's good, but it's lacking the thing that I say is Essex, our name, our profile. So I'm asking to try something else. <laughs> so what we did is we moved over four rows, same producer, same month, a cheese that's nine days younger. He just walks away. Ouais. Parce que là, c'est 815. Oui, non, je... 
qu'on peut trouver dans sa campagne Sûrement, sûrement. Oui, je vous sais, c'est mon livre. Vous pouvez trouver ça, mais dans le 51. Mais pour le sexe, non. Non, non. On va aller voir quand même. Basically, we found a cheese for another customer. It's just not Essex, and it's a customer we do selection for. Oui, 7 ans, 815. So, and you can keep it playing, Jewel, while I talk, I think. They keep mentioning fruitiers, and those are the little, little cheese making. Um, houses in the middle of the small towns all dotted around the hillside and so there's lots of family-run cheesemakers that collect milk from the farms all throughout that region and so some just make different quality cheeses and so the uh these selectors bring in um wheels from hundreds of different fruitiers but obviously essex has found a flavor profile that's coming through 851 to be the, consistent and regular, pretty amazing. Fruitier 815, not 851. Yep, 815. So we have about four that we work with, but 815 like just 90% of the time delivers. So we always start there. And we do that more because in case something happens with 815, we want to know the history of other fruitiers so that we can quickly change. Because if we don't ever bother to try other ones and 815 goes south, it becomes a lot of work for us to try to find another producer quickly. It's awesome. Trying to lift the wheel of Comte is what got me my nickname, Mike Tyson. And when I, in the eight caves in France, I couldn't quite lift. That's oh, really? the wheel. I learned a lot about balance that day. It's all awkward. Right? Yeah. I did that. I, I tried to help Mary Quick's guys make cheddar one time and trying to flip 90 pound drums of cheddar that are in a 20 pound stainless steel drum. I tried yeah. once and got really big bruises and then I just let them do their job. It was like awesome. So it looks like everybody loved that pairing. Um, my cheese is gone. So it seems like. <laughs> I have one. I, I, I gave myself two so that I would have. So, what you just saw is literally six minutes of a two hour long process to select every single order every six weeks. So, we try 25 different cheeses on average. Um, and we do that to the point of what I said of, but also sometimes we know we're not going to buy, but it helps us have history and understanding of what's going on. It helps us build relationships and rapport. Um, so that was a tiny snippet, but the point is, is that we're looking for Essex. And so that first time where Jose says, oh yeah, like John said, he looks so confident. He's like, oh, first wheel, I got this. And even Jason, our owner is like, this is great. Yeah, like, great. And yet I said, it is, but it's missing the identifier of Essex. So when John tastes this and I eat this, sure, it's very brothy. But the point I was saying, what I like to find consistently in our comte is the floured crust of bread. So it's kind of this identifier. It's always going to be nutty. It's always going to be sweet and buttery and complex and brothy and like a thinker. But there's this moment where your mouth goes, I just had like ciabatta bread. And that's what I'm always looking for because you can taste that in that environment. These other flavor notes, it's to give you an idea of what it's like in there, it's 90% humidity and around 50 degrees. It's 56. It's very cold, very wet, and the smell is not like parm. It smells like ammonia. It smells like like 409 up your nose. Um, 
So it's very difficult to get all these nuances we can now get, but the things we can get is texture and like that feline flower note. And so if we don't have that, we're usually not satisfied then with it. Um, so that's why we keep trying other things. Hell yeah. Lisa just asked if you actually call the cheese a thinker. I would say it's a sexy thinker, probably. It's a sexy dang yeah. cheese. But yeah, we um so our owner, Jason, um, the profiles, as I mentioned earlier, we're working with cheeses, you know. You know Gouda, you know Comte, you know Parmigiano Reggiano, we also work with Manchego and Feta. And so you know these cheeses, and the variety can all be celebrated within these cheeses. But we're trying to find one profile because it's very difficult to sell maybe four versions of like the same cheese and have customers understand the difference. So the one that Jason likes to look for, the profile is like a thinker, like one that stops you dead in your tracks and you're like, what you just put in my mouth? Like, I'm, and, it, and it develops and the length is there, there's persistence without it being aggressive. So it's kind of that difference with that word persistent versus aggressive, we want length. And so yeah, think about it. Awesome. All right, so on to our fifth and final, our Betty. At the very beginning of this video, um, she is standing outside, so it's a little difficult to hear. She's just letting us know. I got to see a, this very short snippet earlier, um, just letting us know that, that this is the town she was born in, um, and she's showing you the outside of the facility. All yours, Rachel. And this is the last cheese on your plate. Should we have anything left? She owns this, this cheese shop plus another one in Amsterdam about 20 minutes away. She ages cheese and she's the woman that helps us find people like Jan and Joost Anschie of Bildeweide um, and other Dutch producers we work with. So she's our liaison um, to help find these small producers. She sells their cheeses in her shop. She ages some of them in her shop um, and then she helps export it all and help us find the profile we want. So that's why you're seeing the shop and kind of the work that she does. And you're looking at a, an heritage of my family, an old press where the cheeses used to be pressed in. And you can also see the vets where the cheeses used to be made in. In the old days, they were wooden vets, but nowadays they're all uh, of plastic material because they can, they can be easily cleaned. Um, this is the environment which our cheeses really feel good. So we have a temperature of 13.5 degrees Celsius. Um, due to the cheeses with a natural grind, because they suffer a lot if we bring the temperature up even higher. So the Rimmeke or the, the Rongebak, they are all laying here with high humidity. And then you see the Wilde, of course, a little bit of Brab on them. But most of the wheels are being matured in the south of our country. Humidity high, temperature a little bit high, and then we turn the wheels um, now and then, depending on the age. When a wheel is quite young, we turn them like twice a week 
And when they are getting older, it becomes once a week, once a month. And even the older wheels that have this signature, we just turn once every three weeks. Uh, cleaning, of course, cleaning. Cleaning the wooden shelves where the cheeses are laying on and cleaning um, the wheels as well. That's the biggest part of our maintenance of the cheeses. Now, the cheeses I want to talk to you about is the Wilde Weide and the Lampus Signature, which are our most famous cheeses. Wilde Weide being made on an isle in a lake uh, where all the air comes up grazing. They just went outside of this period because it's uh, springtime where they are fed with uh, green grass and lots and lots of flowers. Um, it's a raw milk or a cheese, and to me, it's one of the best cheeses our country produces. It's floral, it's herbal, it's easy to pair. Um, the, temp, the age where we deliver the cheeses to in the US is between 13 and 15 months old, when the crystals are really there, and uh, but it's easy, it's even velvety in structure. The Lamy Signature, of course, um, is a very easy going cheese. Everyone loves it. It's. I'll show you a wheel while Martin is filming the wheel of Ida close up. Here I am with the Lamu signature. And this is actually a cheese made by Cornwall in the Beamster region. Um, there are wheels of 17.2 kilo, and they are being much at least 24 months um, at the premises in the south of Africa. So here the temperature is between 14 and 15 degrees Celsius, but because the cheese has a coating, it maintains well at that temperature. Um, they have the crystals as well. It's a beautiful orange structure with a crispy uh, butterscotch texture and a caramelized flavor, but not too caramelized because uh, that might be artificial. So it's a really clean cheese, which everyone really loves. So that's what the maturing is about. I'd like to take you with me to the cheese bar where I'll show you what my uh, hobby is, but also what a lot of people ask me to do for them. In, a me in the meanwhile, uh, enjoy the lessons. So like I, she said, she's aging cheeses here that are for her wholesale. She sells to a lot of restaurants in um, the area, including Rotterdam and Amsterdam, and then for her own shop. So my biggest hobby is berry. Of course, it's an excuse to have a drink and have a bite of cheese. But to pair those two cheeses is such a delight because they're easy to pair. For example, the Wilde Weide, it's amazing with green tea with jasmine flowers. Did you know that? And it, you know that if you serve the tea in a wine glass like this, the experience is totally different from a cup of tea. You'll start treating the tree, tea like a wine. You look at the color, you start smelling, maybe even a little bit of waltzing before you taste. And if you taste the tea first, you clean your palate. And in comes this cheese in a beautiful clean bed. Imagine those flavors bursting out. So, yeah, tea is actually my favorite to pair, but what about a good beer? I mean, it's fashionable, everyone loves it, and it's a party thing to pair cheese and beer. Of course, wine, red wine, white wine, whatever you want, it's, it's all, it's there, it's easy, but if you want to be daring, try a good firm. Or maybe a Pinot Chant, if you can get one. Of course, port wine after dinner with a fireplace and some candlelight does wonders for your romantic life. Everything is possible, even in a good whiskey, if you want to. But those two cheeses are a delight to pair. Well, this is a little bit about Lamus, about me. I didn't get to show you my daughter because she's on a holiday and my husband is filming. We're the ones running Lamuse and our youngest daughter is at home, unfortunately uh, hit by Corona, uh, but I imagine you all know that uh, 
harassment. Uh, she'll be back soon. She's recovering, so we're good. I hope you uh, enjoy the lessons and see you maybe one time in the Netherlands. That's awesome. That's awesome. So that was Lemieux's signature Gouda. That's a, one of the cheeses that we carry all the time. Um, it is wonderful, along with uh, Brabander Gouda that she also uh, ages, which is a goat's milk Gouda, which is spectacular and wonderful. Betty is uh, one of the queens of the industry. She's outstanding. Yeah, we call I call her the Julia Child of cheese because um, as you can tell, she's incredibly passionate. Um, she was actually quite subdued <laughs> in this video, um, but she's very, her history, she's third generation cheese professional in Amsterdam, and I know we're kind of over on time, so I won't get too much into it, but basically the, 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 the genesis behind this cheese was her goal was to find, you know, we have the boring Casa Vildevada, you have these small farms, that's beautiful and wonderful, but they only make like six wheels a day, five days a week, 46 weeks a year, that's impossible to like be sustainable for a market. So, and also they're great, but they're not that classic. So in her opinion, if she had to submit a cheese to a competition, the Olympics of like, this is what the Dutch do. Um, she wanted something more, the caramel, the crunchy, but with a farm or a producer cooperative that she could stand behind. Um, because as I kind of mentioned earlier, lots of the small farms are going away. Um, or they're doing things, she mentioned artificial sweetness. They're adding ingredients that make it taste sweeter, make it crunchier, and it's not authentic. So she struggled for about 12 years in her business to find a producer that she could really like get behind. And so this one is made in the North, Hano is the cooperative, and that's why she calls it Lemuse Signature. Lemuse is the name of her company. Signature is her signature profile. Um, so it's 24 months and it just has everything you want in a Gouda. We all love caramel, butterscotch, nuttiness, big crunchy tyrosine crystals. Um, but what I really love about this is that instead of it just being kind of like a clock to your face of like bam flavor, um, of course it is robust. Of course it has like an intensity to it. It holds up to all those spirits and wines and whiskey that she's talking about. But it really has great length and complexity. Like it's not just a one and done clock it really actually gives it has brothiness to it it has real like safe for lack of a better description i use it's what like cheesy salty like dust of cheeto or cheese it's wants to taste like right like that really savory salty deliciousness um it has all that as well and it still has a toothsomeness to it so yes it's crunchy but it's not so hard that it's actually like oh i only want two bites her goal, kind of like with Giorgio, is that this is something you keep going back to eat. So. It's amazing. Well, that was incredible. What an amazing experience. Thank you for starting this plan and coming up with it and getting them to do all the videos. I, I am geeking out right now. I'm sure Kendall, once she's done babysitting the kids and making sure they don't run in here during the video, yeah. I'm sure she's going to watch this pretty much immediately. Um, uh, oh, uh, question just, to, you know, well, I'll answer that question about brothiness in a minute, but I just want to thank you, Rachel. That was awesome. That was super yeah. fun. I think that uh, I will I will cherish this. This was cool. As far as a cheese, being a cheese geek goes, I learned a ton tonight uh, just sitting and watching. So thank you. I, thank I'm you. grateful. Yeah, Thank hashtag you for dancing cows. To call you on a Friday night, at like five o'clock, and be like, "Hey, you're not busy right now. Let's talk." <laughs> well, it was awesome, and and it seems like everybody had a really great time. I would say vote for your favoriteest cheese. Uh, I don't know how I would go. I had five favorites. Um, uh, this was just spectacular and so much fun. Um, if you have any questions, I'll hang around for a minute or two. Um, I'll let Rachel take off and go relax yeah. and. Um, but I'll I'll turn off the video part uh, recording here and y'all this was just Ooh, what wine am I drinking? Yeah, it's, this is gonna be like my shameless plug. Okay, so yeah, go for it. I'll, I'll, okay. Do you want me to do you want me to turn off the recording first? Yeah, and, record it. It's fine. Yeah, go right ahead. <laughs> and thanks for joining us tonight, y'all. Thanks for being supporters of these great Thank cheese makers.
Um, but the wine I'm drinking is actually from Aldi of all places. Cause I live in Virginia and don't have in kind of the suburbs and don't have a lot of great options. It's a rosé from Oregon. And it's literally just called the exquisite collection because this is quarantine times and this is what I can get my hands on. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I've been That's drinking it. Yeah. <laughs> It's awesome. It was really good. It was, it's actually very, very good. It's a 2018 rosé. It was yummy. It was yummy. I wanted rosé because I was going to be hanging out with some friends. And that's my, it's a gorgeous 70 degrees here in Virginia. Felt like porch cheese chat wine. So awesome. All right. Let me see if there's any more questions before we pop off. Rosé all day. Thank you. You're awesome. Ville Divide was the best, hard to pick one. This was so fabulous. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Y'all, y'all were amazing. Thank yeah. you for being incredible. Um, and for go we went over by half an hour, but you know what? The cheese makers were worth it. Thanks. Thank you for sticking it out, guys. We're, I appreciate it. We're grateful for y'all. Mm -hmm. have, have a wonderful night. Thank you.